All right, guys. So you can see I got a lot of parts laid out in front of me. Um, this stuff actually just got delivered from Amazon. But before we jump into this, I actually want to pan to the shop, give you guys an update on the bike, and then we could swing back and then we could talk about what's in front of me. So let's go to the shop and then um, I can go into more detail about this. So making some more headway on it. Getting the exhaust knocked out. Radiators are on. These do need a um, extra mount though, it's not done yet. Then this is getting, the radiator cap is getting knocked off and then this stuff will be getting converted to 8 a.m. fittings. Uh, exhaust is being routed back here. The reason for that is because that merge in there has to tie in. And then there's V-band right here. This might, I might have to go to a metal version of this. That's kind of the idea right now. But, um, I mean, it's just kind of their replacement right now. I might actually be able to get away with some heat wrap or something. And, uh, hopefully I can just keep the OEM stock panel on there. But fuel cell, that's all tacked up. It's not completely welded yet. I got a rollover valve going in the top. And then under here, that is that flange that I showed you guys from the um, Suzuki Hayabusa. So all in all, this, all in all with this tank, This did have to get modified a shit ton. Uh, I believe this one holds like two liters. And then this down here might hold um, maybe like a gallon and a half or so. So all in all, it might be like two gallons or something. But um, getting a pretty huge order from Steady Garage Friday. Uh, so this rear shock will be getting swapped out. New forks, new wheels, new brakes, a uh, bunch of stuff. Coils are up here, which actually worked out pretty good. These are uh, LS3 Corvette coils. And um, actually about to go up to another local shop and see if I can get a clutch line made for this. So I got all this stuff. Over here, the Bugatti Panigale clutch assembly and then the slave from the OEM. But uh, it's coming together. I'm probably gonna start pumping out more updates probably daily because this thing is coming together pretty rapidly. Um, but uh, one mishap, I think um, when I ordered the 520 conversion sprocket for this, they accidentally packaged the wrong one. So I got to try to find one local. But that's kind of like the only mishap right now. So. But I'm going to just do a pan around the bike just so you can see. Fuel so actually turned out pretty nice. Show a shot in front. Kind of how the radiator came up, came out. Don't pay attention to the fittings because those are getting cut off and reoriented. Uh, but definitely limited space. It's not working with a lot of space at all. So you can only hope and wish and fit so much. Just the mock-up chain right here. Straighten that out. And then O2 sensor will probably go like in this area somewhere, like right where this merge is. But yeah, all in all, it's coming together. Uh, like I said, I might try to do like a daily update because we were shooting. I have it out this weekend, but I mean, if it's we're running to a big snag, it's really not that big of a deal. So, so I'd rather have it done right than rushing. So, yeah, and then I'll have a 10, 10 a.m. rollover valve on this as well. 
All right, so now that we're back from the shop, um, a few items were mitigated. Um, so one of them being the 520 sprocket ordeal. So luckily, my buddy Joe over at Ducati Detroit was able to find me the last 520 sprocket in the house, which was an absolute, that was an absolute saver for me. But shout out to Joe over at Ducati Detroit. Um, man, lifesaver, seriously. So the parts that I actually have in front of me are for the cooling system. Uh, the reason why I have these weldable um, aluminum AN fitting bongs is because the fittings on the radiator will be getting cut off. The radiators themselves, which are the Honda CBR 300 radiators, those will be getting dash 8AN fittings. So dash 8AN inlet and outlet, and then same with the radiator that's running underneath the engine. Um, those will be plumbed in a parallel fashion. The reason I'm doing that is because those cores and the fittings are substantially smaller than what a stock Panigale application would use. So in order to get around that, I'm essentially dividing flow between each radiator. And um, I would think that would be a little bit more beneficial than running it in series because um, just from what I read on a lot of uh, really, really knowledgeable forums, um, most people like with the application, like what I'm doing, uh, very tight on space, got to run a small core, but the actual device you're trying to cool has substantially larger ports. Like in my case, the Panigale engine has a, a inch ID inlet and outlet. Um, the parallel flow is the way to go from what I've researched. So I'm going to go in that direction. Um, I got these barb fittings. The reason why I have these is because these will actually have to get welded. These will get cut and welded to one of these fittings. This is for the engine side because the, the actual cooling neck on the engine where the inlet and outlet ports are is plastic. So I don't really have a good means to convert it to an AN fitting. So essentially what I'm doing here is I'm using inch ID holes, a very small portion of it to go to the plastic throttle neck. And then this will be welded on the end of this aluminum barb right here. So it'll convert it to like AN fittings, basically to make it look cleaner and a little less janky, I guess you could say. So that's the deal with that. I got to get these back up to the shop. Um, I did get some more Moto Gadget parts in the mail. Um, so this is my master start switch right here. Um, the reason I got this is because I'm no longer using the uh, starter switch integrated into the stock um, Honda Grom throttle assembly because I'm using the KTM throttle assembly now, which is drive by wire. So super nice switch. This is a billet. I know. Please don't beat me up in the comments. I know I love billet stuff, but this is just the Moto Gadget stuff is just nice, man. You guys really got to check this stuff out. Same person that makes, or the same company that makes the PDM, which I got set up right here. Um, I actually have got another one of their billet shatterless mirrors, which is pretty trick. This is all billet as well. I run the same thing on my Turbo YZ project, uh, which will be out next week. Spoiler alert. Um, but yeah, this is a shatterless mirror. It doesn't use a glass substrate. It's actually billet aluminum that has been really, 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 really polished on the other side that gives it a mirror finish. So if you drop the bike, you there's nothing to break because it's all one piece. So uh, once again, definitely give the Moto Gadget stuff a look. They make some really trick stuff. Very high quality for bikes. Um, but yeah, definitely check it out. Um, so you guys can see I got both harnesses set up right here. I did run through these quite a bit. Um, I've eliminated quite a bit of wiring from them. And this is actually what I was getting at. Um, I believe it was one video where I talked about this, but you really have to tailor this stuff to your application. So just, just going off my list here, you can kind of see how I have things laid out. These are basically all the sensor inputs, which is... It's quite a bit. I'll be honest. I didn't realize that I was actually running these many sensors on the bike. Um, it's pretty funny, though, because if you look up here, six of them are dedicated just to the throttle and pedal assembly. So the reason why you have these redundant sensors like this, because you can kind of see the trend here, throttle one, sensor A, throttle one, sensor B. That's more so for redundancy. A lot of OEMs do that. Um, basically, how this would be set up is you'd have uh, two inputs 
So one input would read from the zero to five volt range or zero to four and a half volt range. And then the secondary sensor will read from uh, zero to like 2.5 volts or exactly half of what the first sensor did or reads. But um, mostly all of the drive-by-wire assemblies have that uh, sensor redundancy. It's more so for safety. Um, but you can see how I have all of that stuff on connector A because I just kind of want to keep it pretty, pretty tidy. You can see all of these are things that would be mounted close to the handlebars. Um, so that's kind of how I organize that. And then you can see all of this stuff right here would be stuff that's kind of like in the mid to rear section of the bike. So that's kind of the, the logic that I used on that. Uh, the other outputs over here, um, obviously fuel injector one and two for cylinder one and two, and then the coils for cylinder one and two and fuel pump quick shifter. Haven't decided if I'm putting that on the bike. Um, and then I was going to integrate, um, some, uh, software switches, but I kind of want to cut down on wiring and I also want to have the harness pretty simplistic because I really don't have a lot of time right now. Um, so most of all of the actual, um, functions and whatnot, they'll be controlled on the handlebar switches on my YZ. I did take it a step further because the fuel tech does allow you to have software switches to where you could basically tap the screen and it would have like, let's say if you had like a headlight switch on the handlebars, um, it would allow you to turn on the headlights through the actual, uh, fuel tech ECU software. Uh, ECU interface. So it's kind of like more so of a flex. <laughs> That's kind of what I used it for. Uh, it was pretty sweet to show people that like I could hunk the horn virtually. I could turn the headlights on virtually. Pretty much everything that you could turn on physically with physical switches you can do in the actual ECU touchscreen interface. So um, and what I mean by that is on the fuel tech you can see when I power it up you actually have the ability to have a, oops, you actually have the ability to have virtual switches and um, there'll basically be redundancy with triggering outputs and stuff. So I usually tie in the headlights and a starter button so I can actually do a push to start virtually on the screen because I think it's pretty cool. But um, you know, it's, it's not needed, but it is a cool feature. Um, yeah, there's that. Um, I do have the PDM set up right here. This is the Moto Gadget M Unit Blue. Uh, this is really, really trick. This is, in my opinion, the best way to wire a bike. This is why every single bike project that I will, that I'll do, it'll get one of these. Uh, this does communicate with the phone as a built-in alarm, as built-in, um, current, uh, current analysis. So every single circuit, you can see how much current is pulling, um, is wirelessly, um, control capable. So I could turn off, I could turn on or off any circuit through my phone, through the app, uh, GPS tracking. And then it also monitors every single trip that you take on the bike. So even on my YZ, I can look at I can look at trips that I took last year. I can see what my top speed was during those trips. I can see what the weather was, the density, altitude, everything. Like it, this, I'm just now scratching the surface on what this thing is actually ca capable of. Um, but yeah, this is a very nice device. Uh, I might have to make a video dedicated just to this. But um, you can see. Things are in full swing, so <laughs> the bike, hopefully I'll have it back in my possession by tomorrow. That's why I'm trying to get all these parts organized because there is a lot of fabrication that needs to happen tonight. And then I need a, probably about a good two days to actually do my wiring on it. So this is pretty much what the harness looks like now. But uh, yeah, I'm waiting for the harness materials to come in the mail from Amazon. I ordered a big Deutsch kit as well as uh, some um, waterproof heat shrinking because I do want to make the harness look nice. Um, I usually use like the Tessa tape stuff because it has a pretty good um, outside like fabric appearance. And then, you know, just kind of do what I do on that. So I did the YZ harness. So I'm going to use the same logic 
with how I constructed that on the Grom harness. So hopefully everything turns out nice. It was a pretty big milestone when I actually ran the engine back a few months ago because I kind of figured out all of the inputs from an engine perspective as far as the gear position goes, the throttle bodies, basically anything electric on the engine. So also got some uh, sensors. Uh, if you guys watch my channel regularly, especially when I was wiring the Turbo YZ project, uh, you will know that I like to use the GM LS sensors because it is super easy to integrate these. So I got an IAT sensor with the stainless steel bong. Um, since technically I'm not running any type of like air intake or air ducting into the throttle bodies, this will just be screwed into a stainless steel fitting that's going to be welded on the frame just to get, you know, ambient air temperature. Um, so that's a GM IAT brass sensor. And then this is also a GM LS uh, coolant sensor. Also very easy to integrate. Uh, usually Fuel Tech, they have calibrations already ready for these loaded into the ECU. So it just makes it that much easier and takes out that much more guesswork. So that is why I like using these sensors. Super easy to integrate. Don't have to think twice about it. I also picked up this Holly breather. This was something that I almost forgot to integrate into the fuel cell. But this is a 10 a.m. Uh, rollover vent fitting. Um, this basically allows or basically doesn't allow the fuel cell to um, overpressurize. And then this will also work pretty good with uh, my fuel tank configuration because I am running two fuel tanks. I'm running um, a remaining portion of the stock fuel tank, which basically allows me to fill up in the stock uh, gas tank location. And then there is a 10 a.m. fitting off the bottom of the stock location tank that will connect to this fitting, which will be in the secondary tank that'll be inside of the swing arm to allow me to fill the secondary tank from the stock tank location. Hopefully I didn't confuse you there. Um, and then this will be attached to a hose that will come off the top of this tank or off the top of this fitting, which has this little check ball in there, which will not prevent fuel to fill up inside of this vent. And this will, I'll probably run this to the front of the bike just to um, vent out the fumes and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, it's in full swing. Um, I probably will drop another video tomorrow because tomorrow should also be a big day. So this one, this will be raw, unedited, um, just so I can get it out faster, you guys. Because I know a lot of people are curious about this build. But um, it's just, you know, I'm only working with so much time and recording adds a great deal of extra time that you usually don't account for. Like the YouTube, it can doing a YouTube video. This can literally turn a 30 minute job into a three hour job. So um, I'm just trying to figure out the most efficient way to do things and then also not bore you guys at the same time. So um but if you guys could please do me a favor, please like, comment, and subscribe. Um, you know, projects will keep rolling. I'm trying to finish up my my bike projects. Uh, getting the last few parts for the actual Turbo YZ, which will be back together next week. And, you know, I'm just trying to keep it moving. So, once again, please like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, follow me on Instagram, TikTok. If you have those socials as well, I'll leave the link down in the bio or the description of the video. And yeah, just stay tuned because I'm trying to shoot to have this thing out this Saturday at the Woodward Dream Cruise. So if you see me, come up, say what's up, take a picture, whatever. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, until then, guys. So uh, stay on the lookout for updates and ride safe. Peace.